All right. Got the thumbs up. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you on this gloomy Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to get started with some worship this morning. Um, Joseph's not here, so it's going to be a real nice little living room worship sing-along. So stand and sing loud with me, please. For all that you've done. Your name will be lifted up. You have answered the cries of the weak with your endless strength. You broke down the walls, defeated the enemy. You have silenced our fears with a song that your people sing and this is our God we trust in him he's our salvation this is our Lord we will rejoice he made a way This is our home, and death has been overcome. You will wipe every tear from the face of this troubled world. And this is our God, we trust in him, he's our salvation. This is our Lord, we will rejoice, he made a way. And when at last we will see face to face, mighty God, Prince of Peace, you A mighty God, Prince of Peace, you will reign. Every voice, every tongue will proclaim. Lord of all, King of kings, we will sing. Oh, and this is our God. We trust in him. He's our salvation. And this is our Lord, we will rejoice, he made a way. And this is our God, we trust in him, he's our salvation. And this is our Lord, we will rejoice. a seat. We've got some announcements. Don't know me. My name is Sarah McCool. I serve on part of the staff team here at Element, and I get the job of welcoming you into service this morning, letting you know a little bit about who we are at Element and some upcoming events that we have going on. Um, but first and foremost, a very special thank you and welcome to Oh boy, that went well. Thank you to anyone who is new and welcome for the first time. Yeah, unforgettable. Okay, 
Uh, if you are joining us for one of the first times, we'd love a chance to know that you are here. Whether you are here in this room or joining us online, we are just happy that you're with us uh, and we'd love a chance to connect with you. If you are watching online right under this video, there is a link to our digital connect card. You can fill that out and we can get in touch with you that way. If you're here in the room, um, behind the seats in front of you are our connect cards. You can fill one of those out and bring it back to the welcome center to me. I'd love to meet you in person if I have not scared you off at this point. Uh, here at Element, we are all about Jesus. Uh, we are a gospel-centered community who finds our identity in Jesus, and we hope that that is the thing that stands out the most about uh, us when you think of Element. So uh, most of you know we have our upcoming church-wide baptism celebrations coming up. We hope everybody has saved the date for Sunday, September 5th. We are going to celebrate with swimming and food and hanging out, and it's just going to be a wonderful time to get together and celebrate the people who have made the decision to be baptized. Um, if you are thinking about being baptized, we have two upcoming classes uh, to give you a little more information, let you know what to expect from the day, things like that. If you have a child who is um, in elementary school through middle school, their class will be next Sunday at 1230 in the kids building just across the parking lot. Um, or for those of you who, um, if you're in high school and above and you want to be uh, baptized, we will have the informational class actually following each service next week. Uh, and that will be in the barn um, across the dirt lot over there. So we would love to see you. And even if you aren't being baptized, please plan to come because it is such a special day. Another quick reminder and last reminder that this coming Saturday, the Element Hikers are on their next route. They are at um, they will be going to Oso Flaco, and if you download the Church Center app and join the Element Hikers group, you can get meetup times and all of that information there. Lastly, um, we've got a couple different announcements that we want to update you guys all about regarding Delta High School as the school year is about to kick off. Over the summer, their beloved principal, Sal, who we've built a great relationship with, actually moved into a uh, position at the district office. He's been replaced by um, someone named Nate Maz. He's wonderful, and he's very excited to continue the collaboration with Element. So we're really happy that we're going to still be getting to work with them um, in that way. And so if you can keep them in your prayers and him in your prayers during this transition time, a few of the ways that we are partnering with Delta ongoing some of you may have noticed we have a little black shed behind the trailer over here this is our delta emergency resource center we are trying to keep it stocked all year long so that as kids come into the school that might have needs we might be able to just walk in and fill those from the shed we would love to keep those stocked um, with your ongoing donations of toiletries specifically deodorant toothpaste um, and small hand sanitizer bottles uh, also there's been a request for jackets. Jackets are always something that's very needed across the students. Um, someone had already asked me last service what size for jackets, and we were told the style is big. So you're safe with going big. Um, so the and then the last Delta announcement that we have is actually this evening, we are going to be gathering on their field just across from this room uh, for some time of prayer for the new principal, the students, the faculty, everything that's about to kick off. So if you are available at 6 p.m. tonight and would like to join us for that time of prayer, we invite you to. If you are unavailable and cannot make it, uh, we have a little flyer at the Welcome Center that has some specific prayer points that you can be partnering with us in prayer this year for. Huh. So that's all the announcements I have for you this morning. Now, if you'll take a moment to wave to the people around you as we reset the stage. Yeah, I can't lift this. I was tuning my guitar. Well, we could tag team it if it was you and me. We'd be like... Okay, so, interesting, last service in the middle of 
uh, service, the live stream died, apparently. I know, I know. And as I'm talking, I see like Sarah come running back, pointing at her computer and looking at Michael. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to keep talking. I don't know what's happening. So that happens this service, you won't even know because I'm a professional. I did a wedding last week in the middle of it. Uh, the, the mic went out in the middle of it, and I just kept going. And afterwards, people were like, that was amazing. And I'm like, happens all the time. I'm good. I'm good. So uh, first thing I want to do as we start is I want to say a big thank you to a lot of you. Uh, my wife, if you don't know this, she had her hip replaced on Monday. And yes, she's very young at 20 <laughs> no, she's very she's very young to have a hip replacement, but um, we've always been the ones who are like you know helping people when they end up having something happen in their lives. Like this is the first time people have you know kind of taken care of us a bit. And I have so many cookies, I don't know what to do with it because it's all about me. <laughs> no, uh, the people have brought food, and we've been we've been, been really thankful. So it's been interesting to be on this side of it. So thank you so much for that. Uh, the other question we're getting a lot right now is new county guidelines and, and face mask mandates and stuff like that. Uh, we received a lot of questions about it, so I just want to I muddy the waters even more, I guess, with my answer to this. Uh, if you know Element, we try to be the best possible gospel community as a people we can be. We want to focus on Jesus first above all things, and then out of that comes the focus on people and county and, and, and all those things. And with so many things changing, it's very difficult to navigate this because of all the different voices and all the different information that's out there. Our staff got together this week to talk about this, and almost none of us started in the same position. Almost none of us ended in the same position so we understand how hard it is with all the different voices and all the different things that people say so after talking to our county supervisor I talked to him about it a bit and and he said you have to understand something he goes it's it's not law he goes it's not law like that that they, they can't do anything about it but you know looking at Delta and some of the fears that are out there we, again, don't want to be a people who have to police you or anything like that, but we should be those who care about our neighbors enough that we'd be willing to mask up in indoor spaces where people ask us to. You go to a store and they have a sign out front that says, you know, wear a mask inside. If you want to shop there, wear a mask. Don't be irritated about it. Just step into it. Learn how to love those around you. And so in, in a room like this, we've gone back to our greeting is having you wave at people. Again, we're not going to police you. We have masks outside all of the, of the doors that are here. It, that it may tighten up even more than, than we are this week, but we would just encourage you to be a people who love those around you enough that if someone is uncomfortable, please just, just throw a mask on. It's not a big deal. Uh, it doesn't stop you from worshiping God at all. Uh, so just let's be that. For us at Element, uh, we're having all of our children's workers mask up in, in all the kids' rooms. Uh, we, again, our greeting's different than the traditional manner, uh, and we are still live streaming. If anybody's, you know, worried about coming in person, that, that's still going to be there. But we want to do is focused on Christ above all things, so let's do that. Uh, lastly, I want to tell you about Thailand, our church plant in Thailand. Uh, they... Uh, COVID has kind of re-spiked there, and so the people who are doing our church plant there kind of ran into uh, some harder issues with that. And so a lot of things they're doing is meeting one-on-one -on -one and praying with people, still trying to, you know, move that mission forward. I think they're doing a great job, but if you would keep them in your prayers, especially in the midst of, you know, a, a country that doesn't have an infrastructure that allows things to disseminate as quickly as maybe ours does. So keep them in your prayers, and that would be great. All right. Has a lot. Uh, if you're a new to Element, welcome. There are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. They're also on the communion tables, as well as uh, these sermon notes. Uh, the sermon notes we have, they're, they're short. They're half page. On the front, you're going to get uh, the apparently ginger prophet, uh, Habakkuk, since he's got the red hair. Uh, on the back, you'll get some stats about who he is. You'll get the verses we're covering, and you'll get a couple questions to reflect on what we talk about today. If you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called YouVersion. You click on more and then events in you version will come up by GPS in your smart device and you will get sermon notes, verses, questions, announcements, everything that goes with today's message. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? And this is Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 17. And it says, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Let's pray. Father, today we ask that you would take us as a people and have us understand your sovereignty 
and that you stand over all human actions and that you can and do weave all things together for your ultimate glory and our ultimate good. And I ask, especially in times that we don't understand what is happening, that we would trust you in that, knowing your sovereignty, knowing your providential grace, and we'd be a people who rest in that. Amen. Have a seat. All right, so we are doing this series at Element throughout the summer called The Miners, where we look at the minor prophets of the Old Testament. Those are the last 12 books of the Old Testament. We call them minor not because they're JV and the other ones, you know, made the tryouts and made it to varsity. Uh, it's because their books are simply shorter than some of the longer prophets, but I don't think they're shorter in terms of theology or impact. So we did overviews of 11 of these minor prophets, just one week overviews. And we didn't really follow a linear timeline with that. We jumped around with when they spoke. And last week I did this as well as this week and for the next few weeks. On the communion tables, we have a sheet of paper. And on that, it's going to have the timeline of when those prophets spoke, who were the kings when they spoke, what that kind of looked like. So if you want one of those, you can, you can grab one. It's also going to be connected to the U version at the bottom of the YouTube video if you guys are watching that today. That's so you can see it. Now, if you grab one of these and you're a little bit older, you might need your readers because it's written kind of small. That's not meant to offend anybody. It's just reality. I was trying to do something the other day, and I'm like, whoa, I must be old. My wife goes, try my readers, and I'm like, I don't need, wow. So I understand. You might need your readers to see it. Now, we're ending this whole thing with a prophet who kind of ends up in the middle of all of these guys named Habakkuk. And we're spending six weeks in Habakkuk because I think Habakkuk really relates to where we are today and will help us to go and interact with the culture we're in and the world that we are in today. Uh, Habakkuk really kind of does this whole idea of talking about people who maybe claim to be the people of God or claim title being image bearer of God, but don't actually live that way. Because a lot of times people today claim the name Christianity or claim the name of God and look and act nothing like God looks and acts. So our hope, or my hope throughout this, is we'd get tired of playing church, that that would just exhaust us, that we would take all the trash that we picked up over the years about feeling like we can't be honest or vulnerable about who we are, that we hide the reality of who we are, and that would all just get thrown out and lost. I, I would love for us to end up being a people who want to speak of God's unchanging grace to the world, who would want to speak of the gospel and understand it everywhere in our lives, that we would understand that God delights in showing mercy to people who do not deserve mercy because it's every single one of us. It is like when Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick who need a doctor, and it's the sick who realize they need a doctor. And there's a lot of people running around today, spiritually speaking, who think they are very healthy, and yet they're very sick sick. And we want those of us who run around thinking how healthy we are to see our sickness so we go to Christ for the cure in our lives. We want God to crush our pride and our arrogance and bring us back to himself because that is what he will do with his people and what he kind of does throughout the book of Habakkuk. Uh, some people today, they will destroy their marriages and their careers and their friendships and their lives before we ever come to a place where we see that Jesus is our redeemer and not ourselves. And I will tell you many times hardships that come into our lives lives, whether it's COVID over the last two years, many times hardships come into our lives, and that is mercy from God, because God wants to draw us to himself, and hardships do that. In the most positive way possible, I would love for God to take Habakkuk and just ruin every single one of us so that God would rebuild us back into his image. I know it's kind of a downer how we're going to start, but that's where we're going to go. All right, so open your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 1. If you have a Bible, that's uh, a page 508. If you have an element Bible, we're going to jump in. Now, last week, I kind of spent most of the time talking to you about the history of where Habakkuk is, where he got to, why he makes the complaint that he does. And he says, God, have you seen my country, the laws they're making, the things that they're doing? It makes my life really hard as someone who wants to follow you to follow you. Will you not do anything about that? And it's kind of interesting. Habakkuk, we don't even know how to really say his name. It's a borrowed Akkadian loan word. And so everybody just says it the same way. So I'm going to use that too. We don't really know. But what today what we're going to do is I'm going to look at Habakkuk's complaint, how God responds, how Habakkuk responds to God, and then really to see what God is doing throughout the course of human history in the world. I know, no small feat, but again, 
I'm professional. We'll figure this out. So Habakkuk chapter 1, starting in verse 2, Habakkuk's complaint to God says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. This is, again, have you seen my country? Have you seen the things that they are doing? Will you do nothing about it? In verse 3, that word iniquity, it means sin or injustice. It can mean a bunch of different negative things. But this is what Habakkuk is saying about his own people. This is what they are doing. And he is asking God why he, Habakkuk, has to witness all of it. Now think of what God has had to witness throughout all of human history, like all of our sin and craziness. And Habakkuk's like, God, why do I have to see this? It's kind of self-centered just a little bit. Kind of like a lot of people in America. We complain about who gets elected into public office and then what laws they passed or maybe who becomes your boss at work or, or who gets that promotion instead of you. And like, God, why do you allow these things to take place? Well, Habakkuk is saying there is moral corruption. There is injustice. And if you're God, you should be doing something about it. Sound just a little bit familiar to us today? I think so. He says the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. He's like, God, you are not even being obeyed by the people who claim your name. Like many times, a lot of people who claim to follow God the closest seem to be the furthest away from him and how they actually live. And for Habakkuk, there's also these military threats outside their country that want to destroy who they are. And so he calls these things evil times. And he sees evil times and God not seeming to want to do anything about it. Today, we are a people who assume that good times are the norm, right? We think everything's just supposed to get better. We get mad when things don't go our way. Uh, think five years ago, uh, Trump gets elected. Half the country is like, hashtag not my president. Four years later, Biden gets elected. Oh, he stole the election. Hashtag not my president. We're always upset about everything around us. We think nothing should be hard. Nothing should come in the way of my own personal happiness. But do you know it has not always been that way? Even in America, the first part of the 20th century in America, you saw World War I, the Great Depression, Worldwide Depression, World War II, the Holocaust. By the end of the 40s, nobody was running around thinking, oh, it's going to get better. Most of the people in the world thought, well, this is just how it is. In 1950, this guy comes along named David Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, probably one of the best preachers London ever produced, and he steps into this area, and he's going to preach the book of Habakkuk because people were asking, why is this happening? Why, did, why is God allowing these things to take place? And this is what he says when he starts to teach Habakkuk. He says, if you understand the book of Habakkuk, you would never have been surprised at what happened. You would have been ready. And I love that because Habakkuk really does prepare us. So what does Habakkuk do? How does he prepare us? What does he say to God? What does God say to Habakkuk? Glad you asked. So I'm going to read to you God's response to Habakkuk in this. It's written in poetry because God's a poet. So this is what God says to Habakkuk. Verse 5, chapter 1. God says, Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. So God's like, there's going to be something I'm going to do, but you're not going to believe it. And it's funny because they'll tell Habakkuk, and he won't believe it. So verse 6, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings, not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. This again is written in poetry because we know horses don't fly. Uh, verse 9, They all come for violence all their faces forward they gather captives like sand at kings they scoff and at rulers they laugh they laugh at every fortress for they pile up earth and take it then they sweep by like the wind and go on guilty men whose might is their god so this is how God even speaks about the Babylonians you may be thinking okay I heard it I don't really understand everything that's there well Habakkuk starts. He's whining and complaining to God about his country, and God will say, yes, Habakkuk, I see it. I have a plan. This is kind of how the whole book goes. It starts, God, do you see this? What are you going to do about it? God says, yes, I see it. I'm going to do something about it. You're not going to like it, and this is what I'm going to do. And Habakkuk will say, I don't like your plan. Make another plan. And God will then say, be quiet and listen to me and trust me. And eventually, by the end of the book, Habakkuk gets quiet, and he listens, and he trusts God. 
Boom, Cliff Notes version. But it's so interesting in how that all happens. God says, Habakkuk, you have to trust me. So why does God say that to Habakkuk? Well, verse 5, it says, God had chosen to send the pagan army of Babylon to come and discipline his own people for their sinful pride. And we looked at how bad that was last week. God is going to destroy his people with the people arguably more wicked than they are. And we think, that's not how God works. Uh, apparently it is. It is. Because God's goal is to grow those he loves to be more like him, and he will use any means necessary to make that happen. Again, today we want the opposite. We say, God, put this person in political power because that will make my life easier. And if my life is easy, I'll obviously worship you. That's not typically how it works. Uh, we say, God, give me this thing, and then I will follow you. And God says, I've got a different plan because it is not about you. Guys, in, in our lives, we are like this with God. God, tell me the plan. I just want to know the plan. And God is like Jack Nicholson in that movie, A Few Good Men. Anybody ever see A Few Good Men? Okay, the majority of you haven't. I must be really old. So I'm going to explain this movie to you. I'm going to do a really bad job of it. But just go with me because it, it kind of, okay. So in this movie called A Few Good Men, uh, you have this, this young guy who gets beat up by a bunch of different soldiers on this base, and there's this whole inquiry. It's like a legal thriller. And Tom Cruise is a lawyer. Ooh, Tom Cruise? Yeah, Tom Cruise is in it, okay? So Tom Cruise is this lawyer, and he's trying to figure out who called this code red that had this kid get beat up and killed. And eventually he gets the commander of the base, Jack Nicholson, on the stand. He's like, that guy's arrogant. I just got to get, so he just going at him. Did you call the code red? Tell me the truth. And Jack Nicholson goes, you can't handle the truth. That's my Jack Nicholson. It's the best I got. Okay. But he goes, you can't handle the truth. I did call the code red. It's, that's really the culmination of the movie. So you just got the whole thing right there. So, but, but Habakkuk's like, God, you know, what are you doing? And God's like, I'm going to call a code red and you can't handle the truth. And Habakkuk really couldn't handle the truth. He wish he'd never heard about it. You know, it's like the world's a terrible place. People are mean. What are you going to do? And God's like, I'm going to take them all out. That's a bad plan. Can we get another plan in the end of this? And we're going to talk about what God says to Habakkuk over the next couple of weeks. But the great theme of Habakkuk will come down to the idea of faith. Do we trust God when we don't understand the beginning from the end? Are we going to follow him even when we don't see what's happening? Do we see God's goodness no matter what? This is like how God shows up in the book of Job. He never answers Job's questions, doesn't answer our questions, but we get a bigger picture of who God is. Are we going to trust him or not? And Habakkuk, like us, has to learn to trust God. Habakkuk struggles like us, but ultimately he will learn faith. So, God, do you see this? Yes, I see it. This is what I'm going to do. So Habakkuk then talks to God a second time, verse 12 of chapter 1. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. It's like, oh, no, 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 that's not really going to happen. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? So what he's saying is, we may be bad, but we're not that bad. So why would you let them do this to us? Verse 14, you make mankind, uh, make mankind like fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler, so you made us all. He, that's Babylon, brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offering to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? God does not seem fair that you would use that evil to punish our evil. Why do they get to keep on killing and you're going to do this to us? So again, Habakkuk goes from, God, do you see it? What's your plan? God says, here's my plan. And Habakkuk's response is, well, your plan stinks. In verse 12, he says, are you not from everlasting? This is literally translated as, are you not infinite? And in English, it doesn't come across all that confrontational. But it's not a question. It's rhetorical. It's like he's accusing God here of something. He's not requesting information. What he's saying is, I thought you were wise. I thought you were everlasting. But apparently, you're not if you're going to allow this thing to happen. Hebrew scholar Francis Anderson says the use of this particular particular phrase or this word are you not he says most of the 96 occurrences of this word in the bible are in vigorous human 
arguments. Nothing, therefore, could have been more abrupt than the beginning of Habakkuk's second prayer in verse 12. And literally, there is nothing like it anywhere else in the Bible. How Habakkuk talks to God. Again, Habakkuk cannot believe that God's going to use the Babylonians to do this. One of the most ruthless and bloodthirsty uh, nation to ever rule upon the earth. That they're going to sweep through and take over everything, including Judah. And he's like, you call that an answer? I just complain. Why do evil and injustice reign? And you're like, wait till you see. I'm going to send more evil and injustice. He's like, what? Are, are you nuts? I thought you were supposed to be infinite and wise. Now, God will answer Habakkuk. We're going to look at that over the next couple weeks. But again, what I told you last week is you have to look at where Habakkuk goes. He goes to God. He knows God is holy. He knows God is good. So he goes to God himself as he struggles with his doubts. But he never even hints, like the thought never crosses his mind that he would ever walk away from God. To him, that's not an option. To stop obeying, to stop praying, to stop following, not an option. Habakkuk deals with it by praying to his God because he knows that God is merciful and that God is good and that God is gracious. He calls God my holy one. He says, oh, my rock. He is faithfully wrestling through all of this with God. And today, almost nobody treats God like that. Either there's like two extremes. Some people say, never question God, just be a good soldier. Whatever your holy man tells you, that's what you do. And the other side is the exact opposite. Either it's, well, God didn't agree with you, so either God doesn't exist or change God or just walk away. Ever since the Enlightenment, we have this enormous confidence in our own perception and all of our own human reason. We say, I don't see how God could bring good out of this. If I was God, I wouldn't do that. Why does God allow this suffering and evil? Therefore, I'm not going to believe. And Habakkuk doesn't do that. He is intellectually and emotionally honest. He would never think of leaving. Tim Keller, when he talks about this, and I I love this, when Habakkuk calls God my holy one, it's like he's saying, uh, I wouldn't be upset if I thought you weren't holy, but I know you are. And I wouldn't be upset if I thought I could run away from you, but I know I can't. And if I can't figure out life with you, how am I ever going to figure out life without you? you? You are the ones who have the words of eternal life, and that's why I'm so upset. And what he called it was unconditionally faithful wrestling. And he said it takes the gospel to produce that person. It takes someone who understands who God is in his goodness and his infinite grace, which we get a much better picture of than Habakkuk ever did to wrestle with God like this. Derek Kidner says that prayers like this about, that Habakkuk does in the Bible stand as witness to God's grace and God's understanding because it shows he knows how we speak when we're desperate and what we go through. And God doesn't smite Habakkuk. What he does is he takes this prayer and he puts it in the Bible for us to read 2,600 years later. And it's not that we should talk to God like this all the time. I mean, that's kind of be scary. But it's saying that God is God, not just when we have a happy face on, but when we are confused and don't know what to do. It's all about God's grace. We don't need all this perfect emotional self-control. God remains God because he is God. And because of his grace, our relationship with him is not based on our performance. It's not based on how well we handle our emotions. It's based on his unconditional, covenantal, committed love to us on his part. And you will see how the book progresses that Habakkuk comes to understand that more and more as he goes. Gets that idea of God's goodness. Anyway, God tells Habakkuk he's not going to fully understand what he's doing. He says, I'm doing a work in your days you would not believe if told. And again, He tells him, and he he doesn't understand it, because God says, I'm going to bring more injustice and more violence into your life, and yet that's how I'm going to work out my salvation in the world, and you're not going to understand it. You fast forward to Jesus dying on the cross. Same thing. How is Jesus dying on the cross? How does the disciples, why is this happening? And yet God brings salvation to everyone because of it. So there's two things taking place here that we have to understand about God and us, and I'll wrap it up with this. First off is this, we cannot judge what God is doing based upon our timetable or our measurements. Providential sovereignty of God. We cannot judge what God is doing based upon our timetable and our measurements. Habakkuk says, I don't understand. Salvation and blessing is meant to go out from your people, but your people are corrupt and terrible. And God says, I know I'm going to send the terrible Babylonian empire, and they're going to take my people into exile. And Habakkuk says, you call that an answer? And God says, yes, I do. I call that an answer. But again, we get to see something Habakkuk never got to see. If the Jews had not been taken off into captivity and exile in Babylon, they would have never spread throughout the eventual whole Roman Empire. You you look at this. This happens a few times in the Bible. Tower of Babel. They're like, God says, scatter across the earth. And they go, no, we're going to build a tower. 
So they build a tower, and they all come together around the tower, and God goes, ah, people, knocks down the tower, scatters them across the face of the earth. Uh, you go into the book of Acts, and you see the history of that New Testament church. A lot of those Jewish people, what they want to do is congregate in Jerusalem to stay there. And God's like, no, I want you to go out. No! We're going to stay here. And what does God do? 70 AD, he destroys Jerusalem and disperses these people out into the world. Here, they're like, they don't want to follow God. They want to do their own thing. They don't want to go out into the world. And God, and like, no. And so God comes up. He's like, okay, I'm going to take care of this. And God disperses them into the world. We actually call this the diaspora. And there are many Jews who remain part of the diaspora even after they were allowed to return and rebuild their temple and their city. God sends them out. And you have to understand, when God sent them out and they were allowed later to come back and rebuild their temple and city, so many stayed out in these other places, and they started these things called synagogues. And in these synagogues, not only Jews were there, but these people they started to call God-fearers. And God-fearers were Gentile people who understood the scriptures and believed in the God of Israel, which a very interesting thing, interesting thing happens. In the New Testament mission through the book of Acts and moving forward, what you'll see is the people most receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ were not the Jews and were not the pagans. It was the Gentile God-fearers. The message of Christianity is embraced by those people and spreads throughout the world. The Babylonians come and they will take the Jews off into exile. God's judgment. Eventually the Greeks will come and the Greeks will conquer the known world and the Greeks love philosophy and language and everywhere in the known world the Greek language was then spoken and taught to everybody and really for the first time you could write a scroll or a book in one place and anybody anywhere can read it. So the Jews take their Old Testament scriptures, these Hebrew scriptures, and they translate them into Greek, into this thing called the Septuagint, the translation of the 70 scholars. And all of a sudden, people, these Greek people, people and speak, speaking people can actually, I get really excited, sorry, uh, start to be able to read the scriptures in their own language. After the Greeks, the Romans come through and they have this new technology called Rhodes. It's amazing. And they instituted this thing called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, at the end of a sword. But you could then start to travel anywhere in the known world. One commentator says this, if this succession of dominant world powers, uh, the Assyrians, Babylonians, the Greeks, and the Romans hadn't arisen, Christianity would have never spread. And he makes this comment, the violence of those great nations led to Christianity, which has made all nations less violent. See, Habakkuk never could have seen that. And when the Babylonians come through and, and then take them off to captivity and bring them back, that's like 100 years in the making between what happened and when they came back. He doesn't get to see all that, but God does. Today, the communists are kicking all the missionaries out of China. Uh, they're arresting pastors. They're bulldozing churches. What's going to happen? I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. But I can easily see 300 million Christians rising out of this movement, and it will change the face of the world. I mean, God doesn't abandon a place. He's not abandoning China. He is doing something unique in the midst of the chaos and struggle. You look at America and all the things like, God, what about this? And what are you doing here and this and that? I'm not going to live another 100 years, thank God. You know, but, but 100, 200 years from now, you know, I'd love to see what happens because of God's faithfulness, what he does. It's like you go back to Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph is so idolized by his father that he's turning Joseph essentially into a brat. He is ruining Joseph's character. I think Joseph was on his way to becoming a cruel and evil man. But there's a famine coming. Come. And so what do Joseph's brothers do? They sin greatly against Joseph, and they sell him into slavery. And from that, he goes into prison. He has 20 years of misery in his life, and God uses that to grow him up. And he comes out of this, and he saves his family and saves a nation. God uses all of these things. Every single thing that had gone wrong, God uses to bring about salvation. God sees things that we never, ever see. Habakkuk, tell me, God, here it is. I don't get it. I told you you wouldn't get it. The second thing is this, that God says, you can trust me, that we can trust him even when we don't know what in the world we're doing. We can trust him. He knows what he's doing even when we don't. God said, I'm going to do something in your day you would not believe. I'm going to bring salvation out of judgment. Now, if you have a Bible, open to Acts chapter 13. Go to verse 38. 
Uh, so years later, the Apostle Paul comes along, and he is talking to one of these synagogues of Jews and God-fearers that had been dispersed. Uh, this is his first real sermon in the New Testament book of Acts. And Paul recounts uh, the Jewish history and the Jewish story, and he leads them to Jesus as our salvation. Acts 13, 38, Paul then says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. That's Jesus. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. He says, Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophet should come to pass. Look, you scoffers, be a stand and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you would not believe even if one tells it to you. He goes back to Habakkuk 1.5. And Paul says that ultimately what God is talking about is Jesus himself. All these things are going to happen, and you wouldn't believe any of it if I told you. Would you believe that I would come in the flesh, in the person of Jesus, and I would let people lay their hands on me, the God of the universe, and die for your sins? You wouldn't believe that. And so this is what God does. And I know you're saying, Aaron, you just said it was about Babylon. Yes, it is, but it's the bigger story of what God is ultimately doing. It's that principle. God says, I bring light out of darkness. I can and do bring salvation and redemption out of injustice and evil and wrong and suffering. And it all finds its ultimate expression in Jesus. And Habakkuk 2.1, after he says this the second time, Habakkuk will say, I'll take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me. He's going to say, God, I'm going to wait for your answer. I don't understand why you put up with injustice, but I will wait and see. You say salvation can come out of this. Well, I'll wait and see what that looks like. And God's ultimate answer that we get to see that Habakkuk never got to see is on the cross. All of this is finally explained. When God comes into the world and goes to the cross, he takes the judgment we deserve, not in strength, not that it didn't take a whole lot of strength, but he comes in humbleness and weakness. On the cross, he does this because he is holy. We so often focus on the temporary. God is focused on the eternal, that sin must be paid for because of what we've done towards God and one another. Even people who don't believe in Jesus will say, this is an injustice. We're going to fight against injustice. Justice must come. But justice will only come from a God who brings justice. And there is justice that is spoken of about on top of our sin. And this is why God, because he is just, will come in our place because we can never pay for that justice ourselves. And so God it brings that judgment upon himself on the cross on our behalf. He takes the penalty. He takes the judgment on himself. And this is how the cross brings salvation out of judgment. And it brings light out of darkness and brings re redemption out of evil and suffering. As Jesus is being crucified, all the disciples are just like Habakkuk. God, what are you doing? Why do you let the government get away with this? I can't see how anything good could ever come out of this. And yet, the cross is for our ultimate good and God's ultimate glory. On the cross, you get this ultimate Habakkuk moment. Habakkuk is so confused, and he is so angry, just like us so many times in our lives, wondering about God, being angry with him. Where are you, God? And yet God is faithful every step of the way. Jesus will pray in this garden called Gethsemane before he goes to the cross. He will say, you know, God, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. This is unconditionally faithful wrestling for us. Because Jesus knows who the Father is. Habakkuk will ask God, why have you abandoned us? God never abandoned Habakkuk. They may have felt like that, but God never did. He's never abandoned us. God is working through all things in spite of the fact that Habakkuk didn't see it, in spite of the fact that we don't see it. Why? Because God is faithful. Jesus will cry out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is the only one who was ever truly forsaken because our sins were laid upon him. But he does it for us. He takes what we deserve and gives us his life. He extends to us restoration with God because of what he did. Keller says that uh, Jesus got the abandonment that we all deserve, so when we only feel abandoned, we can know we're not. We are not abandoned. We get to know Jesus because he himself was faithful. And that means in the midst of all the things that we don't understand, we can know that God is working and that God is faithful, and that God loves us. And that in turn will make us, hopefully, a faithful and patient, patient people as well as we wait for him. Guys, everything is going to stem out of our understanding of the gospel. I love the perspective that we get because it is so different. 
standing on this side of all of these minor prophets and all the things that they are talking about. We get to see the culmination in Christ himself. And we need to be a people who trust God in things that we don't understand. Why, why is Delta variant coming back around? Why are they masking up again? Why are they doing this? Why are the government passing these laws? Why? I will tell you, it's not that we don't take a stand against injustice. We should and, and, and we do. But ultimately, we trust God through it all, knowing that he will do something glorious and good through all of it because we have the definitive proof of that in the person of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. That God took all of human evil and all of human misery upon himself in order to restore us to relationship with him. And we get to live in salvation because we get to be saved by what Christ did for us. And we live our lives in this humble response to what he has done. I'm going to invite Mark to come back up. And as he does, I'm going to invite you guys to this place of communion uh, where we take this cracker and this grape juice, and you break the cracker like Christ's body was broken for us, and you drink this grape juice. It's meant to be a reminder of what Christ did to rescue and save us, that he comes and he takes the judgment upon himself. He sheds his blood because our blood is tainted by sin. His body is broken because we are enchained to sin, and yet he breaks our chains, and he sets us free by what he has done. He takes all of the sin and injustice that we have committed and of the world upon himself and brings restoration. And so we get to live to be a people of joy and hope. We can even unconditionally faithful wrestle with God in the midst of things we don't understand. God, I don't like this. And if God told us the plan, I'd be like, I don't like the plan. And God's like, I know, but you've got to trust me. And we would just come to a place where we do trust him in the stuff we don't understand. Um, so something happened uh, this morning. Uh, the reason Mark's you know, playing by himself up here, it's not that nobody would play with him. Uh, it's that... <laughs> It's that Joseph, our, our, our <laughs> truth, uh, it's, it's that Joseph, our normal drummer, uh, he and Kelly had their third baby this week. And I, his name's Andrew. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, but yet this morning he sends a text, and, and he mentions that uh, Kelly had to go back into the hospital because of preeclampsia. And so I know uh, all the ladies are like, oh, yeah, okay, so, so you get that. So why? Why is God allowing this to happen right now? We don't know. But we trust his goodness in the midst of it. And it's okay for me to share it. I asked him if I could. And what I would ask you guys to do is be praying for her and them as this kind of takes place. God, what are you doing? We don't know. But God does. And we can trust him in the midst of these things. And so th this is why we as a people can unconditionally, faithful, wrestle with God. I don't understand this, but I know you're good. And as I wrestle through this, I'm going to trust you through every single bit of it. And that's, I think, the people who are intellectually, emotionally, spiritually honest in the world when we can speak and walk through things like that. Um, if you need prayer, uh, Sarah's at the Welcome Center. Grab her. We'd love to connect you with somebody. If you're in a thing today where you are wrestling with God and you don't know the beginning from the end or what to do and you want someone to pray with you, we'd love to be able to pray with you. There's offering boxes next to all the doors. We give because God gave so much to us. Giving is part of our worship. We don't pass the plate. It's just always a response to what God has done. And take, you know, those couple little questions at the bottom of those, these Habakkuk notes and just talk to one another about them. You know, what, what things do you see maybe years later that God was doing that you never understood in the middle of it? You know, I've got a lot of those, but I also have a lot of questions I still don't have answered yet. But I know that God is good. And I know looking at throughout the course of the scriptures that he is going to weave all the snags and snares of all, all of our lives together into a beautiful tapestry because it's what he does. And so we trust him in that. Let's be a people who trust him in all things. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would take us and move us to be a people who understand with our, with our hearts and our heads both your great love that has been given to us. How you have been faithful from the very beginning when our first parents run away from you and you have consistently and constantly chased us down and called us back to yourself. It is so often so easy to get our eyes upon ourselves, even thinking and hearing of the word salvation, of how you've rescued and saved us. We make it so much just about ourselves, thinking somehow you couldn't live without us. And yet the truth is, we just seem to make it so difficult sometimes, I would assume, to love us because we're so nuts. 
And yet you do love us. And you are faithful. And you constantly call us to get our eyes off ourselves and onto you. And in so doing, we get our eyes onto what you want us to do in the world around us. How we can offer grace to those around us. And so this morning I ask that you would take our lives and have us see that we are yours forever. That yes, you hold everything in your hands. But they are hands that have unfailingly loved us from the foundation of the world. And so teach us to be a people who live in that great unfailing love. Looking outside of ourselves and worshiping you in all that we do and faithfully wrestling through the things that we don't understand and bringing you glory in all things. And we ask this in your son's good name. Amen.
Lord, thank you for calling us as a people to yourself. Thank you for doing all the work necessary in order to restore relationship. Thank you for being sovereign and good. And thank you for allowing us to be a people whom we don't understand and we wrestle with you that you offer us grace in the midst of those places. But teach us to be a people who learn to trust you more and more every day. That our hearts and lives would be fully committed to you as you have first been committed to us. Amen. May we be a people who live our lives trusting God and his goodness. No matter what comes our way in the midst of what our country goes through or what our world goes through. May we be a people who are willing to speak good tidings of good news into places that desperately need good news, to places that maybe frustrate us to no end because we think what is happening over here just can't bring any good. But we would speak hope and life and grace to those places because we are secure, because we have a holy one, a rock who has rescued and saved us. Let us be the people who speak the grace of the gospel to the world. Mark's going to do one more song by himself. <laughs> In case you didn't notice. Um, I'm going to need you guys' help on this one, so please uh, stand with me. Clap if you can. Let's do it.
great is your faithfulness great is your faithfulness you never change you never fail oh god and true are your promises and true are your promises you never change you never fail oh god and so we raise up holy hands to praise the holy one who was and is and is to come why is your love and grace why love and grace you never change you never fail oh God and so we guys so much for joining me this morning. Thank you for coming. Hope you guys have a great week. Jesus loves you.